My name's Ella. And I'm Danae. And here are some announcements you need to be aware of. There's a half day on Friday. So enjoy your long weekend. Salem Baptist Church is having their trunk or treat this Sunday. So be sure to come out for that at 5 o'clock. The Winston-Salem Rescue Mission is having a food drive. So bring your canned goods and drop them off in the bins outside the office. Clubs will be next week after high school chapel, so please be ready for that. There will be a new chapel schedule starting November 5th, so be ready for that. Bring toy donations to your homeroom for the Lydia's Hope for the last day is Friday. Spirit Week will be November 8th through Friday, November 12th, so make sure to participate in that in your Viking spirit. Middle school basketball tryouts are next week, Monday and Tuesday, November 1st and 2nd. There will be a powder puff game next Friday, November 5th, so be sure to come out for that. That's all the announcements, so let's get ready for chapel! Middle school energy. That's all I'm going to say. Middle school energy. All right, guys, welcome to chapel this afternoon. Um, we want to go ahead and get started. Tomorrow is a special day in our nation. Maybe you know this already. You might have family members who this relates to very easily. But tomorrow is National First Responders Day. And this is a, uh, a thing back in uh, December I'm sorry, in 2017, Congress passed October 28th to be our day of National um, Emergency Response Day, where we're honoring those men and women who make it their business to do immediate action when disaster strikes. So what we want to do now is I want to turn your attention to the video screen. We're going to take a look as a special video just to commemorate National First Responders Day. Dispatch engine 314, traffic collision, unknown of injuries, Broadway at 20th. myself a hero, but I've met more heroes in this experience than I've ever thought existed. I've been waiting for this day my whole life. I fulfilled my dream, following my father's footsteps. And many of you are children, grandchildren, relatives of first responders. And from Salem Baptist Christian School, we want to say thank you and thank your parents and your family members. So what we want to do right now is take some time to pray for our first responders. That is our firefighters, police, EMT, healthcare workers. Let's take some time now to pray for them. We pray with me? Father, thank you for those who every day put their lives on the line so that we can feel safe and knowing that when an emergency happens, we, we make that call, someone's going to be there. We pray for safety for them as they carry out their duties. From fire to police to EMTs to healthcare workers, we pray, God, that you'll protect them, that you would encourage them. God, that we as students, as faculty, as a school, would do whatever it takes reaching out, helping them in any way we can. But may we always remember to pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, for it, because you gave them to us. It's, it's just an act of your grace. Thank you for those who put their lives on the line for our safety. God, now we turn our attention to our time of worship today, our time of spending time in your word. May you receive all the glory for it. Bless this time. Bless small group later. In Jesus' great name, amen. We got to stand. Let's get ready for worship today.
He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power in fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power in fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb. Slain the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 stop the Lord. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power in fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. There's a place for me, 
I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, always free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. My father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Sing that out. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for this great day and for us to gather together. Lord, help us uh, to be attentive as Pastor uh, Rick speaks or Mr. Kleinard. Help us to be attentive and help us to leave this sanctuary closer to you than when we walked in. We love you and we ask this in your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. All right, guys, if you've got your Bibles, open up to the book of James. We're going to be continuing our study in the book of James. Just a couple things. Today is small group day. So right after chapel, we're going to dismiss you directly to small groups. If you've got to do the whole, I've got to stop and go to the bathroom for 20 minutes, you need to let your small group leader know so they can write you as present. Otherwise, that's going to be uh, kind of tantamount to cutting class. Make sure you go directly to small group. Second thing is you'll know we made the announcement about an updated change to your um, chapel schedule. Never let it happen again. Sorry, no, sorry. just kidding. No. Uh, updated change to our chapel schedule. Um, just kind of let you aware of it. You've been getting email about it. You should have gotten one from me this Monday. The schedule is going to be kind of similar but different. We're going to scale back chapel a little bit. Chapel is going to be an hour. Um, for the most, for every day, it's going to be basically an hour. We're going to cut it back a little bit. We're going to do some things a little different. We'll have fir uh, first chapel uh, of each month. It'll be on 1125. When chapel, you'll get all this email. When chapel is at third period, um, you'll go to, uh, you'll have chapel. Uh, you'll go to class. I should say this way. You go to class for about 30 minutes first. You'll go to your third period. That way your teacher can take attendance, collect assignments, and give assignments. Teachers are happy, right? Okay. Students, not so much. And then, when it's, then you'll come to chapel. When it's on fourth period, you'll come to chapel first. Then we'll dismiss you to that 30 minutes of class so that your teachers can collect work, give work, take attendance. Okay? But if you have any questions, come see me about it. You will be getting emails if you haven't already. All right? So to get started as we go through our series in James, I need a volunteer. And I know this is going to sound horrible, but I need a strong guy volunteer. And no one wants to do this. All right. I want an athlete. I want someone who should know how to do what I'm going to ask them to do. All right. I see a lot of people pointing at people, but I only see one volunteer. Jackson, that's you, man. Come on up. Now, listen, some of you might be going, well, why'd you pick Jackson? Let's give him a hand. Jackson. Come on up, buddy. He's giving himself, come on up, Jackson. He's giving himself a hand, guys. That's pretty awesome. Um, now, all the way up here. As I did that, here's what happened. I said, guys, I need a strong athlete. Everybody started going, him. Jackson says, I'll take this ball. All right? So Jackson, what grade are you in, Jackson? Ninth, Ninth grade. So seniors, if he, about, if he gets ready to show you up. And by the way, seniors, after this is over, you don't get to go, I could have done better. You didn't raise your hand. How about that? Jackson, you ever done a push-up? You didn't sound confident. Okay, so Jackson, ha, do, how many push-ups you, can you do at a time? You've never tried? You never tested it? 
This is your lucky day, Jackson. Jackson, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, all right? And we're going to, I'm going to count it in my head. And here's what I need you guys doing. And I need you to do it in sync. If you can't count in number, like order, don't count out loud. If you're over here going, one, four, G, don't, all right? So maybe I can get uh, one of our beloved PE coaches, Mr. Cornell, to come up and help me here real quick. Can you give it up, Mr. Cornell? He got more cheers. I'm just saying he got more cheers. We should let you do these push-ups, but no. All right. So you're going to, I want you to be counting to, he's going to have 30 seconds. And you're going to give me the, you count 1,002. I'm going to count the push-ups. We're all going to count along, okay? Jackson, are you ready for this? No. You don't want to do, you know, now you want to back out? I did arms yesterday. You did, he just did arms. Okay. Well, lucky for him. He just did arms yesterday. So do you want to tag in Blake Applegate? Blake Applegate, tag up, spread out. All right, Jackson, you take off. All right, Blake. All right, man. Okay. Blake, have you done a push-up before? Now, seriously, not like... Okay, so how many push-ups can you do in a given time? It's like 80 to 100, maybe. In 30 seconds? Not 30 seconds. Okay, I was like, wow, that's going to be impressive. Let me say this. The middle school guy, 31, sec 31 push-ups in 30 seconds. 31? 31. Now, and, and listen, he walked off, and, and he... he, he he is not allowed to raise his hand in class anymore because he can't. All right, that's how it is. All right, ready? Same rule. You're going to count. You're going to count 30 seconds. We're going to count push ups together. So go ahead. You guys ready? Yes. All right, when you're ready, let's start. Go. Five, go. 52? I counted 47. Okay, but to be fair, first of all, you all right? Awesome. This, I'm not sure that's a put, was that what? Yeah, yeah. No, no, don't redo it, don't redo it. Listen, hang on a second, real quick, right. Got, uh, so good job, by the way, you did beat the guy's record. Uh, Blake, you got a girlfriend? I don't. You probably might have one now. Um, so. Have a one. Awesome. All right. Now, all right, if you got Blake tomorrow, uh, he's going to be a little sore probably. Um, maybe walk up to him, poke him. He'll feel good. Good job, Blake. Well done. Now, um, as we walk through that, as we did that, that's a lot of push-ups. Now, let me ask this question. I'm probably going to just, this is easy one. Everybody listen up. Blake, that's not your first time doing push-ups. Blake, have you, do you have a thing where you'll do, try to do as how many a day or whatever? Uh huh. Yeah, I don't care about any of this. How many push ups? I'm asking. <laughs> how, how many, when you do a push up, is, how, do you, how many do you try to get out a day? Okay. All right, the reason I'm asking is a couple years ago, a couple years ago, me and some guys, we tried to do this. Now, we're old middle aged guys. We thought, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this like push-up challenge thing where how many you can do a day. And we would do different types of push-ups. I didn't even know different types of push-ups existed. You've got the regular push-up. You've got the diamond push-up where you're doing this way. Then there was one that was like this. And I'm thinking, is that even possible? And that was a killer. Um, and then there was one day we had to do one arms. I took that day off and, uh, because that's impossible to me. But um, one of the things we learned right away was we had one of the guys that was with us helping us with this. He said that the, the one day what we have to do is we've got to do as many push-ups as we can until we can't do any anymore. And, and all the way down, all the way up, push-ups. And it was focusing on form. It was focusing on making, keeping your back straight, all those kind of things. And then he said, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do as many of those as we can until we max out. And if you know anything about maxing out, it means you can't do any more. He says, once you get to that max out, we do five more. 
Now I'm hearing that going, wait a minute, max out means I can't do any more. He says, once you've hit that wall of I can't, five more push-ups is where you really start building strength, endurance, and resistance. Okay? And as you can see, it totally worked. No, we didn't stick to it long. I decided to get my treadmill. Now, the point I'm trying to make is sometimes when we work out, we do those kind of things, in our physical life, we do the things that are difficult, right, in our physical exercise. I'm glad that Blake didn't do some of the push-ups I've seen before. Uh, as a coach, when I coached baseball here, one of the things I did was have them do some runs. They would sprint, hit, and do 25 push-ups, and then come back and sprint. I'm building up different weights. And this one kid I had in, in the team, I was like, how many push-ups can you do? He's like, uh, I, can, I think I bust out 100 at a time. And I meet, I'm like, there's no way you can bust out 100. Coach, I can bust out 100. Okay, man. I said, all I want is 25. So you're, you're going to sprint, you're going to do, do it, and then you're come back. And it's kind of a race with somebody else. All right? So they take off. He gets there. He hits the ground. Here's his push-up. I'm like, I think that's a dance. Uh, I don't know. But he just goes out there and goes, bust them out, and then comes back. But the thing about it, he has like a pride on his face. He's like, told you. I'm like, whatever you just did looked more like a medical episode <laughs> than it did a push-up, all right? And so we had to teach this guy. The guy he was going against was down there going, he started laughing because he's like, there's no way this kid. So listen, sometimes we do the bad form and we don't, you're not doing anything when your push-up is that. It's that all the way down, all the way up, building the resistance. It's painful. It hurts. Blake's probably not going to be hurting tomorrow. He's probably like, I'm fine. If I would have done that, if you'd have walked up to me yesterday or tomorrow and just poked me right here, I would have just fallen to the ground, cried. You would have had to call maintenance to pick me up. All right? Because as you do these things more, you get used to them, and you can do more. My cross-country guy, where's cross-country? Some, yeah, here you go. What do you say? Yeah, cross country. Okay. One of the things I would do in cross country is if your run is a 3.2 mile race, practice, we're running five miles because I'm getting you ready for that 3.2. And if you've ever been on that run, there's that end of the race and you've got the finish line. And when you've hit that wall, you're like, I don't think I can go any further. Something inside says I can, and you sprint to that finish line. That's big deal type stuff. Yeah, I don't have enough strength. I got one more time. I'm going for it. I'm doing that. That's what we're talking about. Now, you might be thinking, hey, hey Pastor Rick, is this going to be like how to do a proper push-up class? No, what I'm going to suggest to you is that what we're talking about, what we do with our physical bodies in exercise and working out, things like that, is the same true in the spiritual life. And with that, let's go to James, and we're going to look at chapters 1, verses 2 8 through 18. Today we're talking about authentic endurance. Last, last time we talked about authentic identity, who we are in Christ. It's wrapped up in who we are in Him, not in things we do. But I want to talk about this idea of authentic endurance. I'm going to read for you verses 2 through 18 in uh, the ESV. Here's what it says. John, uh, James says, Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now we'll stop just for a second. That verse doesn't sound right. I'm supposed to count trials as joy. The ESV says count it all joy. The actual wording is count it pure joy. It's pure joy. It's, it's absolute, unequivocal joy. Why? When I go through trials. Let's, we'll get back to that. Verse 3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all above or abo uh, to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven by the, and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And I'm going to skip down to um, verse, uh, a little bit later on, verse uh, 12. Uh, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, 
For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God promised to him who love him. Verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Verse 18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Before we begin... Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity I have now to share your word with my friends here. And God, I pray that you would help us to understand what your word is saying here. Give us wisdom, give us good attention, and give us patience as we learn from you. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want to do right now is give you a few what I'm going to call trial truths. Things about trials that we need to know from this passage. Now, typically when we think of trials, we try to avoid these like the plague. All right? First trial, I want you to understand. First trial truth. Number one, trials are a gift from God. Trials are a gift from God. It says that in verse 2 through 4. He says it there, count it all joy. And then if you look at verse 16 and 18, He says later, every good and perfect gift is from above. Talking about those trials. Now, that's not how I pray every morning. And you don't either. For the most time when we pray in class or right before the day or whatever, we pray something like this. God, give us a a good day. And what are we asking God to do when we're saying give us a good day? We're at, say again. We don't need any struggles. We're asking for, if we had a test scheduled, let that teacher be sick. I know you get excited. I hear you. You don't think I, you don't think I can hear when you, t- oh, I heard he's out. No test. Like, how's he doing? Don't care. All right. We're, we're praying for no drama. Not the class. I'm not talking about the class. I'm talking about your, in, your, in your life. Parents are getting along with me. They're not bothering me. Even though I, got, I did something stupid yesterday, Dr. Campbell did not see me. He just didn't see me in the hallway. Give me a good day. Let the sun be shining. Let the traffic be clear. Right? Let the lunch be amazing. That's how we're praying. The problem with that, and again, I'm not saying let's be horrible people and we ask for drama all the time. But there's something actually in that word that trial, that's a good thing. Matter of fact, the Greek word used for that is always a positive term. It's, a, it's like the idea of testing, okay? It's the idea of like testing it. The, con, the, the idea here is, John is saying, I'm sorry, James is saying that when your faith is going through a trial, it gets tested, and the idea, it gets strengthened. James is using a device here called a sorite. I'm going to show it on the screen. It's kind of a step-by-step process. This first step leads to the next step, which leads to the next step. Does that make sense? Here's an example. Um, If my children want pets when they were younger, when they wanted a pet, we start off with pets that were easy to handle. All right? Get a goldfish. If it dies, we bury it at sea. Some of you figured out, I I flush mine. That's what I'm saying, okay? I don't send them to a special farm through the toilet. I send them to Jesus that way. Everybody got me? Now, if they don't take care of their fish, they starve them, they never take care of them, I'm not going to give them a puppy because puppies are hard to flush. You can tweet that, all right? They ruin your puppy. I can't do that. I don't want to destroy. I don't, I don't want to give them something with more responsibility. I got to build on it. I got to build on it, okay? That, that idea So here's the idea. So the first thing James says is this testing, this testing of your faith. What does that do? What's that going to lead to? Next step, to endurance. The testing of your faith leads to endurance. It's a lot, the the imagery he's using here is a lot like learning how to run. And I'm talking about running for the sake of exercise. So um, my, uh, 
I was never a runner in high school. Matter of fact, we, my PE coach would come in. He'd say, okay, guys, run 20 laps, and then you can play basketball. And it was a basketball school, and I was the slowest runner. So I guess who never got to play basketball? Yeah, my, whole, my 20 laps always took the time of class because I would walk it. And it wasn't until I was a little older, I was like, I want to really pick up running. Matter of fact, we had a 5K here, and my students were challenging me, hey, are you going to run the 5K? And I'm like, no, I don't run unless I'm being chased. And uh, even then, I give up. Some of you guys are the same way. You don't even run if you are being chased. You just lay there and say, kidnap me. All right? But when you're running, what I learned how to do was run a little bit at a time. So let's say you're in class and Stevenson or Cornell said, all right, we're going to run 20 laps. I don't know how many you run. But that can seem kind of daunting. But what if you chose one out of those 20 to run? I'm not saying run all 20. And by the way, don't jump into it going, all right, I've never run before. I'm going to run 10 and walk 10. No, you're going to die at lap three. Got to build yourself up to that. All right? So maybe walk a lap and then run one. Maybe if you want to try to do half of them, you could walk a lap, run a lap, walk a lap, run a lap. And then push yourself a little further. Once that gets comfortable, once that gets easy, run two laps and walk one. Run two laps and walk one. And then push yourself till eventually you're running all the laps. Do you understand? That's what he's talking about here in this passage. He's given the idea that the testing of my faith, I'm building myself up, I'm going through these trials, and it's, make, it's giving me the endurance so I can handle deeper stuff. That's the idea. What, what James is saying is, is that God lets this trial happen to give you the strength you need to be better and have more endurance. Why? Because here's the final goal, for you to be mature. That's what James is saying. The goal is maturity. The goal here is maturity. He says, and this is a quotation what I'm about to give you here in a moment. This quotation is from the ESV study Bible. It says this, trials are tests that challenge faith. Trials are tests that challenge faith. They're pushing you further. When trials occur, one should count it all joy, pure joy, not meaning worldly or temporal happiness, but rather a spiritual, enduring, complete joy in the Lord who is sovereign over all things, including trials. You see, the idea here is that he wants you to be stronger and better than you are right now. So I have three children, and all of my children had to learn how to walk. Have you ever seen a baby or a toddler learn how to walk? It is the funniest thing on the planet, in my opinion, because the knees don't bend. Have you noticed? They're they're like that guy at the circus that's, right? You know what I'm saying? And and children learning how to walk, it's really not walking. It's more just controlled gravity, right? Especially when they see mom, they're going, remember, they're holding the arms? And the kid that's doing this cracks me up. He's like he's doing the thriller. It always made me laugh when my kids are like, ah, oh, it's Michael Jackson. And so anyway, they're doing the walk, and then they see mom, right? And you, now, here's the thing. There is a vital component that is necessary in teaching or learning how to walk. It's learning how to fall. Did you notice that? Learning how to fall. Have you ever watched this happen? Maybe you're a creeper and you see this happen in a family area somewhere. Kids doing the, right? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, you can see it getting ready to happen. She's getting ready to fall. You know that moment. They're happy because they're up. And you can see the moment on their face when they realize they're not going to be up much longer. It's just this great epiphany hits. They're like, right? Down they go. And you got two types of parents when that happens. You got the freak out parent. Oh no! Right? And that kid was fine until mom starts going, no! And now they're going, are my knees still there? Right? Is it what's going on? Is it bending this way? But then you got me, who I'm over here going, all right, you bounced real well. And the kid's like, yeah, I did. Right? You see my point? Now listen, you've got to learn how to fall. Parents have to let their kids fall. Otherwise, they're never going to learn to stop falling that way. 
Imagine if I had never let my kids fall when they were learning how to walk. You'd see them walking down the hallway for a third period. And we'd make fun of them. I would help you, all right? Because that's not something normal. We have to learn how to do that. Now, what we're doing when we do that is we're, our muscles are getting stronger. The kid can't handle it. He can't barely walk. He's building his muscles up. The more he or she walks, the stronger they get. The stronger they get, the more they stay up. They don't fall down. You see the point. You have basically learned to walk by learning how to fall. Same thing's true for riding a bike. Remember that? Remember training wheels? You got them taken off eventually, hopefully. Hopefully you guys are still not like heading into like somewhere, you're riding your bike somewhere like, oh, I'll see you guys later. And you pedal off with a really nice bike and some training wheels. That's weird. Okay. By the way, there's some motorcycles that exist out there right now that are basically training wheels for, have you seen those? I kind of make, my favorite is when they go by another biker and they do that whole biker signal. I'm like, don't throw that up there. You're riding basically a, a tricycle with an engine. You don't get to throw that sign out. Um, so we learn how to do these things. We get stronger as we pedal and we stay upright. It's not easy, but we're learning these things. We do it in every aspect of our lives, yet when it comes to our spiritual life, we go, no, I can't. Why would God let a trial happen to me? That leads me to my next thing. Number two, our mistaken response to trials reveals the true condition of our hearts. Like, Mike, you wouldn't look as me, at me if I'm helping my children to walk my, when they were younger. If I was doing it now, you might look at me weird. But if I was doing it when I was younger and I'm letting them fall, it's okay to fall, it's okay. You wouldn't look at that and go, what a monster parent letting his kid fall. Okay, you hopefully wouldn't say that. Yet, we do this when we talk about God. We do things like, well, if God, why, why would God let me go through this if he loves me? Or we ask this question, God doesn't care, does he not care what happens to me? Why would he let this happen? We might even say things like, God brought this on me. I can't believe God did this. The problem with that is God brings trials in order to strengthen our faith. This is a good thing he's allowing to happen. It's okay. It may not seem good. It may not be something we want to happen, but God is using it for his glory and our good, our overall spiritual health. We can take it. He's getting us stronger, and he's delighting in doing it. Number three, sometimes to avoid responding incorrectly, we've got to ask God for wisdom and insight when we're going through this trial. When we're going through a trial, we have to ask, God, I need your help. I don't get why I'm doing this. I don't understand it. Let me go back to the illustration of teaching kids how to walk. When I taught my kids how to walk, when they got to flat surfaces, they owned it. Man, when those hands dropped and they weren't doing the thriller anymore, they had it. You know, they're doing the whole, right? They got that going on. They feel a little swagger. But when they're going uphill, when we were, ever, when we were going on walks and we get uphill, now the kid, have you ever, had, ever seen that kid do that? He can't survey the terrain. He's walking, all of a sudden he's like, right? He's saying, this is, this is a hill. This is a hill. Now, my kids, they knew what to do. My kids, whenever we were walking and we we're going up that hill, here's what they did. They looked over at me. Now, I'm not, going, I'm not a monster. I'm not going to go, no, do it yourself. I'm not going to do that. And then I'll, I'll go up the hill, little kids that are going, all right? No, absolutely. Grab the hand, I'm not picking them up. I'm not carrying them. I'm not dragging them. They don't all wait. By the way, they don't stop walking. It's not like I'm dragging them up the hill. They're walking with me. We're going uphill. Right? Now, here's the key. When you extend that hand up, when, when we are going through a trial, and we're like, God, I don't know how I'm doing this. I don't know why you're letting this happen. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. When we pray and ask God for wisdom, that's, this is what we're doing. That's what prayer is, guys. It's you without even words, just handing that hand over going, I, I need your help. I can't do it. I'm going to need you. And God's not going to go, do it yourself, suck it up. You've been saved since you were a little kid. Figure it out. He doesn't do that. Look at the passage it says. 
When you need wisdom, ask of God. He gives it generously and without finding fault. He's not going to criticize you about it. When I'm holding my kids' hands while we walk up the hill, I'm not going, you got to toughen this junk up. You got to I'm not doing that. I'm just delighting and helping. Guys, can I tell you this real quick? Some of us in this room have this messed up view of how God operates because you've had some messed up people make you think that's how God operates. God is not some heavenly torture person who just can't believe you haven't done enough yet. God delights at putting his hand down and letting you grab that pinky and him giving you the help you need. And if you're thinking God's anywhere else, any way else, I, I have to tell you, you've messed it. God is not ready to bring down the hammer on you constantly because you don't measure up. God knows that you can never measure up apart from his grace and his strength. Next thing. Trials give us the opportunity to display our belief in God's faithfulness and sovereignty. Here's the idea. When we go through trials and we experience those things and we ask God for help, we're saying, God, we may not understand what you're doing, but we know you're doing everything for your glory and our good. All right, track with me, guys. Open your Bibles up. Let's look at James. We're going to look at verses, or chapter 5, real quick, verses 7 and 8. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. And this part of James connects with the part we've been looking at so far. He says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, you read that passage, you're like, uh, when did we start again to farming? Here's what James is talking about. James is talking, James wrote this letter to people living in the Middle East under a climate that was existing in the Middle East. So we got to kind of understand that. In the Middle East, in Palestinian climate, you had an autumn rain that occurred just after they sowed the seed in the ground, and it gave that first growth. And there was a spring rain that happened just before the harvest. And both of those rains were important. Now, even though three-fourths of the rain came right in the middle, without those two at the first and the end, your harvest wasn't enough. So the farmer would wait. He would wait for those two rains. Now, you're like, okay, are you going to teach about gardening now? No, here's the point. The point is, as you're going through trials, we have to be patient, not trying to get out of it early, you see, sometimes when we're going through something, we're asking, God, take it away. Just take it away. I'm, I'm done. I'm tapping out. I'm done. But God goes, I need you to be patient. I need you to be patient because what I'm going to do with this, through this, is much better if you, unless you, if you don't tap out right now. So when I was teaching my kids how to walk and teaching them how to ride a bike, there were times where, especially riding a bike, one of the kids was like, yes, yeah, too hard. I'm done. I'm like, hey, man, I, I get it, or honey, I get it. It is hard. And I have to be careful because I love riding bikes. I can be kind of arrogant going, it's real easy. What's dad? And they're like, I, I can't keep your balance. I've been riding a bike for years. And I have to tell them, guys, be patient. Dad, I can't get it yet. I, I know, I know, I know. It's tough right now. But if you keep at this and you keep strengthening those legs as you pedal, your legs will get stronger. And as your legs get stronger, you'll be able to keep your balance better. And as you keep your balance better, you'll be able to do more things on the bike. And if you can do more things on the bike, you can go further. It's going to happen, I promise. I just need you to be patient. And there were times where the kid dropped the bike. I'm done, Dad. Okay. I, I, I had to be careful not to go, get on that bike. I can't do that. I don't want a kid riding a bike going, no. <laughs> aren't you happy? No. Right? Can't have that. So we put it away. All right. And I got to be patient. I'm like, okay, we'll do this. We pick, let's try it again. Dad, I don't want to do Okay, you don't have to, but I'd like to try it. Just give me a couple. Just give me maybe one little lap. Dad, I don't want to. Okay, let's try it. And for me, 
one of the greatest moments in parenting is when my kids pick up that bike and they give that one last try and they're ready to quit and they hit the pedal, then something clicks. You know, remember, if you remember riding a bike, just something happened. We are like, oh, wait a minute. I'm not falling. I'm not dying. This is fun. And now it's a point where I'm like, hey, guys, all right, we're done. All right, let's, let's, let's head back. No, 12 more minutes. I'm like, 12, that's a weird number. But let's, they, that's good. I, I get excited about that. But they were patient. I was patient. What seemed like torture for them and wondering why daddy would make me ride this horrible machine, there's a blessing from it. It's benefits. You see what I mean? There's a reason for it. What, what John is, or James is telling us, excuse me, what James is telling us right there is that we have to be patient while we're going through this trials and suffering. I want it to end. I just want to quit. Just, I'm, I'm done. God's in his loving way going, buddy, I need you to be patient. I need you to be patient. I'm doing something here. You may not see what I'm doing, but I'm doing something. I need you to be patient. You see, our response to these trials kind of reveals our hearts. And it really reveals our inner beliefs about how, who God is and if he cares about us or not. So what have we learned today? Number one, God's trials are a part of life. I wish I could look at you and say, may you never experience a trial. But really, you're going to experience trials, and it's good that you experience trials. It's good that you experience them. I would not wish that you don't have to experience them. My prayer is a little bit something, it is a little bit different. And I'll get to that here in a moment. But you're going to experience them. Some of you, if we went around the room and talked about some of the trials you've experienced, you'd start making everybody cry because you've gone through stuff we've never gone through. And we couldn't even imagine it. It's a part of life. Number two, I want to make sure you understand this too. Trials and suffering are not always punishment. Now, sometimes they are. So, for example, if if I get pulled over for speeding, which happens, I don't need to be on the side of the road going, God, why did you let this suffering and trial happen? Or I don't need to sit there and think, man, God's letting me go through a trial. I don't deserve it. No, I deserve it. But not all trials are punishment. So some of us have gotten this idea that whenever we're going through something bad, God's unhappy with us. That's not how God operates. If you've ever read any history about what happened to the disciples, Jesus is who he called his friends, you know that trials and suffering are not punishment. Trials and suffering were, they came with the job of being a Christ follower. You with me? You may be going through trials and suffering right now. It's not because you've done something wrong. It's because God is doing something amazing in your life. And it's okay. Number three. Trials and suffering should pull us closer to God. Sometimes the adverse effect is, the opposite is, is, is one way. When we, when we face trials and suffering, we're like, you know what, God, if this is what you're like, I'm done. And there's a lot who do that. I'm done. But guys, trials and suffering should pull us closer to him. He's doing something in us. He's pulling us closer to himself. He's making us more like Jesus. Number four, trials and suffering are the channel by which Christ is glorified in us. Think about this for a moment. What God is doing in your life when you go through that trial, him making you more like Jesus, whatever it is, he is ultimately going to be glorified in it. And we're glorified. And we are blessed by that. Paul says that he was going through a suffering, but he asked God three times to take it away. And and Jesus says, no, my grace is enough for you. And my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Meaning if you stay weak and suffering like you are, people will know it's not your ability that did this. It's what I'm doing through you. And then Paul, so then Paul goes, so now I I praise God for my weakness because as the weaker I am, the more Christ is magnified. Number five, trials and suffering must occur in order for us to be more like Christ. So think about it. If God is using trials and suffering to make me more like Jesus, why on earth would I ask for a day without any trials? What I'm saying is, God, will you keep that which makes me like Jesus away from me? Why would I do that? 
It's, it's like the theology found in that great cinematic masterpiece, The Emperor's New Groove. You've all seen it. Cusco is now a llama. He's accidentally wrapped around a branch. And I don't remember that other guy's name. Neither do you. Okay. So they're tied together. They're floating down the river. Cusco hears a loud noise. He says, is that a waterfall? The other guy goes, yep. Cusco goes, sharp rocks at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. That is exactly the response. Now, listen, we don't want to become these kind of crazy people wanting trials, like bring trial. But literally, we should pray in such a way, God, if you've got a trial today that's going to make me more like Jesus, bring it on. Now, we've got to be careful with this one. And I've told you guys this before. Every morning when I wake up, I pray a prayer something like this. The first thing that comes out of my mouth when that alarm clock goes off is, are you kidding me? The next line is, Lord, you've given me this day. Your word says in Psalm 139, you've written this day out. And I'm going to have good things happen and bad things happen. I'm going to have trials and frustrations and positive things too. Will you help me to handle all of it in such a way where I'm more like Jesus at the end when I put my head on this pillow again than I am right now because I want to live between the pillows. And guys, some days that's good, but I'm going to tell you, be just flat out honest with you as campus pastor, today, today, I did not handle frustration well. And there was a time when I was getting frustrated about some stuff, some t- just stuff was happening, and I popped off. And I, somebody came to me and said, hey, I know you were frustrated. I'm like, and I was like, oh, I thought I hit it. Like, no, you didn't. I didn't handle it in a way that's more pl- that would please Jesus. So we're not saying you get this all right all the time. The goal is I want to be more like Jesus today for having gone through this. I don't want to waste this trial. And think about that for a minute. If God's bringing that trial into your life to make you more like Jesus, and you choose the other way, you're wasting the trial. You're wasting it. It would be like showing up to work out. The weights are there. Everything's good. But you're like, nah, I'll just sit here and drink this juice. No, you're wasting the opportunity you have. Let, number six, our response to trials and suffering reflect our view of God's faithfulness and God's sovereignty. It's all theological. How I handle what God lets me have every day reflects what I think about Him. Do I believe He's a good God who's got my best intentions in mind all for His glory? Or do I believe God is some kind of jerk who wants me to be miserable? That's how I see trials. And you see trials one way or the other. Friends, let me tell you, my hope for all of you, myself included, is that instead of seeking to have the stress-filled, no problem, life is good day, knowing that trials are going to come, my prayer for myself and for you is that when those trials come, instead of going to the why me, why God would you, I respond with a, what are you going to do with this, God? What are you making me into from this, God? Because our goal and what God's goal for us is, is Christ's likeness. He loves you where you are right now, make no mistake, but he has no intention for you to stay there. His goal is for you to be just like Jesus. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for this time that we have to study your word together. God, if I've said anything that is just merely my opinion, let it be forever forgotten. Let your word be what is remembered. Now, as we head out into our small groups, I pray you bless our discussion. Sometimes, Lord, when we get into small groups, we don't want to talk, and that's okay. But God, I pray that you would open up our conversation as we discuss the things contained in in your word, in James. Bring us together in community, having interactions with young people. Or some of our younger class are going to be with some older students. And God, I pray that they would learn from them and vice versa. God, I pray now that you would bless the rest of this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys,